The Aston Martin AMR22 has arrived, and with it we get our first full taste of how the teams might interpret the new regulations differently when comparing them with the show cars and renders that Formula 1 teased us with on the lead up to this huge regulation change. But, putting aside the pomp of a car launch, what can we actually learn about the car itself? Well, let's dive in. Starting with the front wing, it's easy to see it follows the general layout that was expected, with the team opting for the maximum four element layout that the regulations allow. The front wing's main plane is detached from the nose and has been lifted up dramatically in the central region to allow a much cleaner route for the airflow that we picked up by the underside of the nose, which is also connected to the second element of the wing and arguably increases its span artificially. It's obviously very different, but it does bring to mind the way that Red Bull positioned their camera pods on the RB8, creating their very different hammerhead configuration. Whilst we're on the topic of the nose, it's a slender wedge shape design that tries to avoid the more dome shaping that the models released by Formula 1 had previously shown. As you can see, the underside of the nose rises towards the chassis. This then tapers out upon arrival in order to meet the chassis dimensions which suggests that the team are trying to get as much air under the car as early as possible in order to feed the new, much larger underfloor. Taking an overview of the front wing, I always find it interesting to note where a team decides to paint the assembly, with transitional areas, such as the leading edge, always left bare, which begs the question to the shape of the paint around the second element of the front wing and the nose. The huge regulatory shake-up this year means that many of the methods that teams have had in the past to be able to generate outwash will be much more limited. One such avenue is the ability to use strakes underneath the wing. Those have been taken away from the teams, which puts even more emphasis on the role of slop gap separators. Teams will be able to use up to eight of these on each side of the wing, and you'll note how they've been angled differently by Aston Martin in order to help the airflow navigate rearwards. A similar role will be played by the infrared camera pod and the front wing adjuster in order that all these parts play a crucial role in a more agreeable flow regime across the span of the wing. Looking now at the two upper flaps, we can see that they've been tuned to provide downforce in the central section whilst also helping drive airflow along the flank of the nose and perhaps providing more outwash in the outer section than the FIA might have preferred. The AMR22 features a push rod suspension at the front of the car and a pull rod suspension at the rear, just as we've become accustomed to over the last few years, and despite the fact other teams might still choose other options. This also gives us some small indication that Mercedes will continue with the pull rod layout at the rear of the car too, given that Aston Martin purchased some of their hardware from them. Before we get to the part of the car that's really captured everybody's imagination, let's take a look at the splitter and bib section underneath the chassis, as there's something here that we've seen teams use before. If you can cast your mind back to the last really big regulation change, we had Braun GP's BGP001, a car which is perhaps most widely recognised for its regulation-busting double-deck diffuser. However, the BGP001 featured a number of other very neat tricks, some of which I was lucky enough to see when one of the cars came out of storage a few years ago. So please excuse the poor picture quality, as this is one of the pictures from out of my archive, but here's the snowplow-like design that featured on the car that year, and which bears a significant resemblance to what we're seeing here on the AMR22, albeit adjusted to suit these prevailing regulations. This snowplow design undoubtedly sheds some vorticity of its own, and depending on the shape and position of the one being used by Aston Martin, it might either be strengthening the vortex created by the bib below, or weakening it. This will depend on how the other localised flow structures are behaving, but make no mistake, the intent here is to improve the airflow's behaviour as it makes its way down the car. Right then, let's get into the design of those side pods, which see a box shape inlet sat pretty much as far forward as the regulation boxes allow, with the side pods bodywork tapering away and left in bare carbon to give the impression that the inlet is more curvaceous from certain angles. Inside view, this horizontal periscope-like box section at the front of the side pod then balloons downwards to prepare for the radiators, intercoolers and other ancillaries that are housed within the side pod. These components are clearly more reclined than we're used to, in order that the team can find the right trade-off between packaging them and enveloping them with the surfaces that provide an aerodynamic boost. 
This high-waisted design also allows for a gigantic undercut, one you could probably fit a small child in to be honest, and will allow a considerable amount of air to make its way along the side pod towards the coke bottle at the rear of the car, but perhaps we could call it a baby's bottle in this instance. Anyway, moving on swiftly, the one thing that appears to have drawn more attention than anything else is the gills housed on the upper surface of the side pod which are used to reject heat generated within and allow the team to have an extremely narrow cooling outlet at the rear of the car. Perhaps the reason why everybody's attention has been drawn to these cooling gills is that they were not possible in the previous generation of cars, and we actually have to go back to the V10 era to see more examples of them, with the Renault R25 providing perhaps the best example of such a design from that era. Now, if we cast our gaze back towards the middle of the car for a moment, we can see just how high the leading edge of the floor is this year in order to gather up the airflow into the Venturi tunnels beneath. On the outer edge of this region, Aston Martin have their edge wing lent over to help disrupt any tyre wake that might fancy an adventure through this tunnel, whilst the team also had three strakes mounted under the floor to help tidy up the airflow that makes its way inside. The front section of the floor is also lifted when we compare it with the rear section and features a scroll on the edge similar to what we've become accustomed to over the last few years. However, whilst the teams are able to have a flap mounted above the floor in this region, Aston Martin are yet to mount one, so we'll have to wait to see what they come up with in this department when we get to the pre-season testing and the first race. The rear section of the floor is actually interesting in several respects, as we have the emergence of a more forward kick line before the main one with the team needling at the maximum dimensions in order that they can boost performance, whilst the outer section of the floor is rolled slightly too and also features a slight kick ahead of the rear tyre. This is kind of a hangover from what we've seen in previous years where teams tried to limit the ingress of tyre squirt into the diffuser's path, albeit this should be reduced in 2022 owing to the smaller sidewalls on the tyres. Aston Martin also became the first team to show us a workable version of DRS with the actuator and pod mounted in the centre of the wing and the two pivots clearly visible where the flap would open. Meanwhile the rear wing itself is what you'd kind of expect from these regulations, with a spoon shaped main plane used to overcome the transition into the volute shaped end plates. But whilst it does have that spoon shape, the central section has a kind of inverted widow's peak between the two mounting pillars, which is likely done to try to offset any losses that they create. The team have also opted for a double element beam wing as the regulations permit, with a cup section formed around the exhaust to help redirect the plume that is created. There's also a slot in the proximity of the LED lights mounted on the trailing edge of the end plate, which will clearly have some performance benefits, and we're sure to see other variations of this from other teams. As you'd expect, the diffuser takes up the maximum area and has a trumpet-like trailing edge with a small gurney-like lip. But what I find to be a particularly interesting detail is the half moon shaped cutout on the diffuser's sidewall, which probably helps overcome any unwanted flow collisions in that region and better feeds the edge vortex of the diffuser. So there we have it, the Aston Martin AMR22, the first real car that we have seen this season and one that shows some interesting variations upon the renders and show cars that we've already been presented by Formula One management. I hope you've enjoyed this brief analysis of the car and if you have don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel if you want to see more of this type of content.